Okay, this is a brief look at distinguishing additive genetic variants from dominance genetic variation. So we need to first to make sure we're clear on heritability. So you've read about heritability, um, how we measure it, how we can control for the effects of the environment through foster parenting studies, like with birds are a great example. Um, so we have said that one way we can measure heritability is to regress the average between parents with the average among that couple's offspring. So we're looking at here a regression of mid-parent height to mid-offspring height. So we've got our cloud of points, we've got our best fit line. If we want to just abstract for a minute, think abstractly, and say that all of the variation among parents is due to their genotype, then we can think about each point on the x-axis being a particular genotype. And this is going to relate to the figures we're about to look at, specifically related to additive and dominant genetic variation. Okay, so each place on this x-axis is a genotype. And then um, each place along here we can think of as a phenotype. So the extent to which the genotype, which is then passed on to the offspring, is expressed in the phenotype. The relationship between your genotype and the phenotype is this slope, heritability, neurosense heritability. The variable um, for this symbol is H2, that's not H squared, it's H2. So this is the estimate of the fraction of the variation, the amount of the variation that among parents that is due to their genetics. And how does this work by comparing parents to offspring? It works because what are parents passing to their offspring? They're passing their genetics. Maybe they're also passing their environment and that's why we need additional um, ways of controlling for shared environment, like foster studies with birds. All right, so neurosense heritability. And in this case, the slope here is 0.84. So this says that about 84% of the variation among individuals is due to their genes. All right, so let's think a little bit more about what goes into genetic variation. So it's not just the alleles that you have for a particular gene, but it is the interaction among those alleles. And now we're gonna simplify. So we're just thinking about height, which is a quantitative trait, lots of alleles involved, also an effect of the environment. Right now, we're going to simplify all of that and think about um, two alleles determining the phenotype, and we're gonna ignore the possibility of environmental variation. Uh, before that, let's define additive genetic variation and dominance genetic variation. So two parts of genetic variation. Additive variation is like the um, face value of your alleles. So the variation among individuals that's due to the effects of their particular alleles. So if you have a, a big A, you get this much effect. If you've got another big A, then you get that much more. If you've got a big A and a little A, maybe you get this much and then that much, right? So exactly what are the alleles doing? So some alleles work in an additive fashion, like maybe pigment alleles, for instance, um, at least that's an easy metaphor to think of. So if you've got um, a red pigment and a, another red pigment, you have really dark red eyes. And if you've got red and no pigment, then you've got kind of medium red eyes, right? Additive genetic variation. Dominance genetic variation um, uh, accounts for the amount of variation among individuals that is due to interactions between these alleles. Right, so dominance relationships that well, if you have the red allele, it doesn't um, matter if you have another red allele or a pink allele or a brown allele, maybe red is dominant, right? Okay, so two, we can, what we say is partition the variance. We can partition genetic variation into additive and dominance components. All right, so here's where we're gonna abstract and think about um, three possible phenotypes attributed to two alleles. So in this system, there is no dominance. 
So if you've got two A1 alleles, you've got a phenotype of one, whatever our units are. Um, one of each allele, you've got a phenotype of one and a half, and two of A2, you have a phenotype of two. So this is what our population histogram would look like. We would have lots of offspring. We're thinking Hardy-Weinberg equilibriums, random mating. So we expect that 50% um, of our population is um, has this intermediate phenotype. 25% of our population has one or the other of those uh, homozygous types. And so then this is the distribution of phenotypes. Most of our individuals have this intermediate phenotype. 25% um, each have one of the extreme phenotypes. So then let's relate the average uh, phenotype for each of these genotypes on another plot. So let's look at, um, let's put genotype on the x-axis and phenotype on the y-axis. So here we've got phenotype and the amount of the population that has that phenotype. Now we're saying for individuals with this genotype, what is their average phenotype? And because there's no environmental variation and we're thinking that this simple one trait determines the phenotype, there like are no error bars around this dot, right? Uh, everyone who has genotype zero has phenotype one. Okay, so genotype zero, phenotype of one, genotype of two, phenotype of two. Genotype one, these heterozygotes have a phenotype of 1.5. So this is our measure of genetic variation. Now remember, how are we measuring narrow sense heritability? We're measuring it with a slope of the best fit line between parents and offspring. And uh, while we were looking at that other regression, I said we could think about the parent x-axis like genotypes and the offspring x-axis like phenotypes, which is now what we've got here on the right-hand side, the relationship between the genotype that you have and the phenotype that that yields. And our parent offspring regression was saying the genotype for the parents and the phenotype that is yielded by the offspring. Okay, but you can see hopefully the relationship here. So for this example with no dominance, if we put a line of best fit through these three points, these three possible phenotypes corresponding to their three possible genotypes, the line of best fit runs exactly through each of the points. There's no leftover variation that is unaccounted for by our regression line. So in this case, um, our best fit line, our regression, our measure of narrow sense heritability perfectly lines up with um, all of the genetic variation. Okay, so in this case, V G is equal to VA. Now let's look at an example of complete dominance. And you could look at intermediate examples, but we're going to go to the other side here. So in this case, if you've got either two or just one allele A2, you've got a phenotype of two. And if you've got uh, two A1s, you have a phenotype of one. So our population looks like this histogram. These are the individuals with, who are either homozygous A2 or heterozygous. They've got a phenotype of two. These are the individuals who are A1 homozygous. They've got a phenotype of one. Now let's look at our um, regressions, our plots. So here we're just thinking about VG generally. Uh, our first genotype, everybody's got a phenotype of one. Our other two genotypes, everyone's got a phenotype of two. If we try to put a best fit line through these points, there's no line that's gonna hit all of the points. And so our best fit is our best fit, but it's not a perfect fit. There's not a perfect relationship between this regression and the variation that we actually have in our population. So um, this line then, this measure of additive genetic variation doesn't perfectly match up with our model of genetic variation, overall genetic variation. So the best fit line doesn't explain all of the points. Okay, and remember, why are we talking about this? The best fit line is the 
way that we're measuring heritability, Narosense heritability. So what Narosense heritability really is, is a measure of additive genetic variation. It's not um, measuring the amount of variation among individuals that's due to these dominance relationships. Um, so here we've got some variation between individuals with genotype zero and individuals with genotype one. That's not just due to the alleles that they have. It's also due to the interaction among the or between the alleles that they have. And that's what dominance genetic variation is. Okay, so summary. Uh, what's the difference between broad sense and narrow sense heritability? Broad sense heritability is thinking about uh, has in the numerator genetic variation VG. Um, narrow sense heritability is only measuring VA additive genetic variation, the variation that is there because of um, the additive effects of alleles. And so we're not getting a clear picture from our regression line about dominance genetic variation. So when we hear about heritability, usually it's referring to narrow sense heritability, this measure of additive genetic variation divided by the P, all of the phenotypic variation that's due to genetic components and environmental components.